What we've been doing so far is to pick up some of the keynote ideas of the book of Daniel. And I shall do that for a little longer before we embark on a global exploration. We thought of a matter of history. And then we looked at a matter of values. Now we come to a matter of education. Nebuchadnezzar was a genius at many levels. And his policy was to take the brightest and cleverest people from his conquered nations, bring them to Babylon and train them for three years, like we do at Oxford and Cambridge. That's probably where they got it from. <laughs> and the second level of people he tended to send back to the places that they'd come from. The very best, the elite he kept in Babylon. He chose young people. And fascinatingly, he insisted that they did not simply learn the Babylonian language, but they learned its literature. He was going to train people who could live and serve Babylon from the inside. I think that is remarkably enlightened. Because we specialize so much these days, if we do science, we don't do literature and so on. But literature and language were two of the basic things that they learnt as well as their own subjects. Now, the text goes on to tell us that they were assigned the royal food to be educated. And we are introduced to the four friends, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the next thing we are told is that the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, and <clears throat> Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. I want you to imagine the students meeting their Babylonian colleagues in the university refectory on the first evening. And the Babylonian student notices these four and he comes over to them and he said, My name's Nabu, what are your names? Well, I'm Daniel, I'm Hananiah, I'm Azariah. Gosh, that sounds very interesting to me. What sort of a language is that? Daniel, I've never heard that word before. Oh, it's actually Hebrew. Oh, yes, I heard. Nebuchadnezzar had a bit of a campaign and he bashed you folks up. Well, I'm very sorry about that. But you'll enjoy being with us here at the University of Babylon. Now, does your name have a meaning? Because my name does. I'm named after one of the gods. Yes, Dan Eel. God is my judge. God is your what? God is my judge. Gosh, what a grim concept of God you've got, Daniel. No wonder we bashed you up. <laughs> I mean, having God as a judge, a sort of tyrant up there in the sky, sounds like an ancient Christopher Hitchens, this chap, you see. Um, up in the sky, always looking and seeing and judging it. Oh, says Daniel. You're not really thinking straight, are you? Uh, I noticed our lectures tomorrow are in law. And I heard one of our friends say that he wanted to be a judge. Don't you believe in law and judgment? And in any case, if you believe in law, justice and judgment, what backs up your concept of judgment? And you can see a discussion starting. And then Hananiah breaks in and says, look, Daniel, uh, this is okay, but we need to balance this conversation up a little bit. I need to tell him what my name is. It means the Lord shows grace. Oh, says Nabu, you believe in the judgment God and you believe in the grace God. Oh, no, 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 says Mishael. There is only one God. Who is like Jehovah Mishael? And the conversation deepens. And Hananiah explains the grace of God. 
Mishael, the uniqueness of God, from which he gets his name. And then finally, poor old Azariah comes in and he says, look, I need to say something too, because do you know what my name means? It means that God helps. He's real in our experience. There aren't four gods. There's only one God. Do you know I could nearly preach a gospel message from their four names. Have you noticed that before? Ah, but they weren't going to be allowed to do it, you see. Because Babylon changes names. And there's a deliberate homogenizing policy they were given Babylonian names that in part were parodies on their Hebrew names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. May Baal protect his life or possibly treasurer of Baal. Hananiah was changed to Shadrach, the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael to Meshach, who is what Aku is. It was a direct parody on his Hebrew name. And Azariah became Abednego, the servant of Nabu. This was a clever policy. It's a matter now of identity. Babylon was interested in their identity. And nobody was allowed to use their ethnicity or their name, particularly a name that drew attention to the uniqueness of God, that was not to be tolerated. Does that resonate with you in contemporary Europe? This ancient document comes alive, doesn't it? When we begin to take it seriously. These men were not to be allowed to use their special names that pointed towards God to do that. And we meet all kinds of pressures in our society that run in the same kind of direction. Make them all the same. Now, we need to think a little bit about this, you know, because this was not New York, it wasn't Washington, it wasn't London, nor was it Beijing. It was Babylon. And if I were to ask you, what does Babylon stand for in the ancient world? You might say, what do you mean, what does it stand for? Well, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. And the radio announcers used to say, Moscow has said early this morning and Beijing has answered and Washington has... Because the capital stood for an ideology. What's the ideology of Babylon? What did it stand for? Well, we don't have to guess. Because scripture tells us in Genesis exactly what it stands for. This beautiful city was built on a certain philosophy. And it goes like this. Come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower that it might reach to heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves that we should not be scattered abroad in the earth. Have you noticed the habit of building tall buildings in our world? Every nation's got of a taller building than the next nation. You ever ask yourself why that is? It's a very ancient thing, reaching for the stars, being taller than everything else. Well, it's wonderful to see the architecture that went into even a ziggurat, let alone the Petronas Towers, or any famous tower in any city of the world. But what's it saying? Well, let's concentrate on this central thing. Let us make a name for ourselves. Babylon is interested in names, ladies and gentlemen. 
Babylon changes names. And Daniel was of the tribe of Judah. And as such, he was a descendant of Abraham. And you know that Genesis goes on in its very next chapter to talk about the fact that Abram was called out from Mesopotamia, from that very area, from Ur of the Chaldees, which was also quite a spectacular city. And God called him out to begin a journey to become a pilgrim. And God said something very interesting to him. Abram, come, and I will make your name great. The Bible is a tale of two cities. We meet them as we saw yesterday in Daniel, the city of Babylon and the city of Jerusalem. And Abram was called, as the letter to the Hebrews tells us, to look for a city, the city, whose architect and builder is God. God is interested in cities, you know. But let's concentrate on the fundamental philosophy of life because it's crucial. Because it gives us such insight into the nature of the way in which Daniel lived. You're either living for the one city or the other. Because the issue in Daniel's life was not, what city do I live in? He lived in the city of Babylon. The issue for him and for me is what city do I live for? And there are only two ways to live, aren't there? We're either trying restlessly to make a name for ourselves or we're trying to learn to trust God for the significance that he gives us. I will make your name. That's not easy, is it? All of us struggle here, don't we? Because we look around and we see people more talented, more gifted, more this, more that. And we sometimes wonder, well, what is my identity? Who am I? I'll never forget, many years ago now, I was talking to a group of students in a country distant from here. And I was talking actually about Genesis, and as I finished, a girl got up out of the audience and she walked to the front and she stood and she lifted her face so as everybody could see it. She was beautiful, at least half of her face was. The other half was hideously disfigured by a birth accident and she just said this she said you know I'm not a fatalist I'm not a determinist but I want to tell all of you that today before God I want to confess that I can for the first time accept the way he's allowed me to be there wasn't a dry eye in the place. And I remember listening to that girl as I'd spoken. And I thought, I wonder, have you really got that far? Do you really accept the identity that God has given you? The name that God has given you? Because if you do, they may change your name outwardly as they did to Daniel. But you'll never lose your identity. Do you know what's fascinating? Daniel was given a new name. They tried to obliterate his Hebrew name, but his name survives the empire. He's called Daniel in the second half of the book. So that's the next big thing here. Oh, but it's deeper than that, ladies and gentlemen. We need to think seriously about this because something happened at Babylon historically. There was a confusion of languages. It resulted in Daniel having to learn Chaldean and a cuneiform script. And when people pursue 
the creation of their own identity apart from God it leads to semantic confusion now there are two ways this happens the simplistic way is what happens here you take a different name and you ascribe it to the same object Daniel becomes Belteshazzar but he remains the same person there's another thing that's happening very regularly today and that is keeping the name and changing what it means. You won't find it hard to think of words that are changing their meaning in our society. Tolerance used to mean tolerare in Latin, I disagree with you but I will uphold your right to publicly state your view. That's what it used to mean. It now means you will affirm me without any hesitation or hold back. You will celebrate me even. It's a different concept. It's the same word. Family, marriage, relationships, you see what's happening in our society? The clever confusion of Babylon. It's interesting, isn't it? What is your name? Who are you? And what we're facing in our society at the deepest level is a redefinition of what it means to be human. What is a man? What is a woman? And here is something fascinating for you to think about. You know, science started in the beginning of Genesis. God told man to name the animals, so taxonomy started. The Bible is pro-science, and I hope you've noticed that. But there's a several bits of the universe to which God gave names. Have you ever noticed that? They're so important. God called the sky heaven. Why did he do that? Well, I leave you to think about it. But I want you to notice this. God called the human being man. The name semantically originally claims scripture is derived from God. I'm tempted to spend a long time on that concept. There is a great deal in a name, you know. And here in the book of Daniel, we're being opened up into a, a whole kaleidoscope of ideas that go down and down and down to the very roots of meaning. What a challenge it is. Daniel, like Abram, Resolved to be the person that God made him. Do we? Or do we find in our hearts that pushy desire to create our own identity and make a name for ourselves? We all know what that means, don't we? So it's a matter of identity. But then finally, there is a matter of image. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Now in this context, that is a profoundly important statement. We saw that the vessels that Daniel Saul had been transported from Jerusalem to Babylon. They symbolized the absolute sacredness of God and we related it to the notion of sanctifying Jesus as Lord in our hearts. That is, setting him apart as holy. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Why? 
Or can you not see the connection? Daniel embodied the very holiness of God. He was a sacred vessel in himself. He had some inkling, it seems to me, of what becomes a full-blown doctrine in the New Testament. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? The physical temple in Jerusalem was miles away from Babylon. The vessels were in the museum, tainted by having been relativized, and Daniel was determined that he would represent what that stood for in a society. And he wouldn't defile himself. No. There is a lot of debate about what this means. Why wouldn't he eat the food? And the theologians have said many things. Some suggest that it was to do with a kosher loss. Others suggest that it was because uh, that also has to do with the kosher laws, that the, the blood might not have been drained properly and so on and so forth. Others suggest that it had to do with the fact that eating the food would be associated with idols, but yet others object to that and say that idols aren't mentioned. Well, I look at that, I read it, but I notice they're missing something. It's not only the food he declined, it's the wine. And Jewish law had no prohibition on wine, provided, of course, it was drunk in moderation. Why the wine? And of course, think about it 30 seconds, and it's obvious. We thought of the sacred vessels of God in the temple. Where do we meet these ideas all again? Chapter 5, Belshazzar's Feast. Where they're now drinking wine out of those sacred vessels and blaspheming God in an act of profound spiritual defilement. I don't know. But you know, in Oxford... We have a little ceremony. Well, it's just a simple thing. Before meals, we say grace. I often do it in my own college. Acknowledging God. And following Georges Roux on ancient Iraq, where he says that the country was thoroughly permeated by idolatry in a way no other country before or since has been, it is to be unimaginable that you could have a university situation with the wine of the food without some sort of dedication to the gods involved. We're on safe ground when we see the trajectory that it led to. I wonder, I couldn't prove this to you, but I suspect that Daniel was so super sensitive and he saw that if he compromised at this level at the beginning, it might lead to something like Belshazzar's feast. And I suspect that at Belshazzar's feast, he thanked God he'd taken the stand he took at the university. Now, of course, the questions arise. Scripture tells us what they did then. It doesn't tell you what you should do today, but it does tell you one thing. Am I resolved not to defile myself? Ladies and gentlemen, I think we all know what defiles us, don't we? Whatever we think of the food offered to idols, the issue is that if we are going to stand in society, character is crucial as we were reminded last night. It is not a mere question of intellectual or administrative competence. If we are going to stand for God, we'd better make up our minds before God not to let ourselves be defiled. And so that seems to me to be the approach. In all of our situations, which are very different culturally than everywhere else, Somewhere we've got to say, look, what in this situation is going to defile me? And I think in Daniel's, he accepted the education. 
He learned the language and he learned the literature and a lot of it was totally pagan literature, although it's fascinating to read and I've read a lot of it. But in his heart, he did not accept the idolatrous interpretation of the universe that lay behind the whole education system. I face a similar problem, of course, in my university. Because for many of my colleagues, the default position is naturalism and atheism. So I face the question, how do I live in this society and at the same time protest against a false interpretation of the universe? And we have to solve that each in our own way. Daniel's book tells us what they did. It doesn't tell us what we should do. But it seems to me here is a constellation of ideas that belong together. Our identity will crucially lead to questions about our character and our integrity. And that will have to do with our credibility in society. So Daniel said, I'd like to be allowed just to eat vegetables. And the chief, who looked after the students, said to him, he said, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with a king. It's an image, you see. I'm scared of what you look like if you go on with this protest. It's not identity now, it's image. I'll never forget many years ago I was a student. And I tried as best I could to witness to a very famous scientist who was sitting next to me at dinner. He was a Nobel Prize winner. He invited me back to his room invited the professor of theology and one or two others as well, sadly. I was the only student. He said to me, Lennox, do you want to make a career in science? He said, yes, sir. Give up these childish notions of God. They will cripple you. They will damage you. They will damage your intellectual image. That's it. So I said, sir, what have you got to offer me that's better than what I've got? And he came out, to my amazement, with some very ancient and outmoded version of Bergsonian evolution. So when he'd finished, I said, are you really surprised that I prefer to stay with what I've got? <laughs> but that's it, you see. That's it. The pressure is enormous for your image. And we all know it. Because there's none of us who's not afraid. It's marvelous to be here with so many gifted people committed to serving Christ. It's very different when you get out there and feel the pressure and you feel you're standing alone and you feel you're defined by connection with God and it's becoming embarrassing. We've got to fight the fear, you know. All of us have got to fight the fear. And the older I get, I identify two major problems, and they're fear and shame among Christians. I fear. So Daniel proposed the first clinical trial of history. And he said, test us for 10 days. So after 10 days, uh, they uh, turned out to be, as it says at the very end, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. The king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. That's what happened to them. 
it needn't necessarily happen to me, you know. <laughs> There is no guarantee on the basis of this scripture that if you honor God, you will turn out to be ten times better than the other people in your university department. That's what happened to them. But please notice that better is a relative term. So that's what it is, isn't it? You trust God and you end up being better. Now, we should notice that word because it's very deliberate, because we've been seeing that there's been a relativization of the absolute. So, are people like Daniel and his friends simply to be distinguished by their intellectual power? That is a very important question. And so it leads logically into the next chapter where this issue is now probed at great depth. Is there something more than human intellectual power? So it happened that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And uh, the dream disturbed him mightily. I'm not surprised because he saw in his dream a colossal man. Now let me just give notice of this. Chapters 2, 3, and 4 talk about three colossal things. There's a colossal dream image. There's a colossal actual statue or image. And there is a colossal tree. They are, of course, connected. So the first half of the book has an introduction and an epilogue looking at it a different way from yesterday. And it deals with three colossal things. Now if you had gone to Nebuchadnezzar and asked him who the biggest man was around the place, you would probably have lost your head for not realizing that you were talking to him. And in his dream, as we know, Nebuchadnezzar saw a colossal man smashed by a stone that came out apparently from nowhere in the mountains and crushed the image to powder and grew to fill the old earth. So old Nebuchadnezzar was very disturbed and he called in his think tank. The bright boy. So now he was going to put their brains to the test. They were cleverer than the rest. So the topic's the same, you see. And he said to them, now gentlemen, I don't presume there were no ladies there, but there might have been. Now gentlemen, I have had a dream, yes, your majesty. And I would like you to interpret, yes, your majesty. We'd be delighted to do that. That's our job. Thanks for the salary raise last month. Um, and they waited. Well, he said to them, you tell me what I dreamed. <laughs> wow. You can sense necks beginning to feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> and of course, Nebuchadnezzar didn't tell them. He was very bright. You imagine Nebuchadnezzar, who believed he was by definition the biggest man that had ever been seen, telling a crowd of very bright people under his power that he was about to be cut down. This is or the Orient, ladies and gentlemen. They would have soon rustled up and intrigued to make sure it happened. So he said, I'm going to test you. You tell me what it is. And there was a hasty consultation, and again they came obsequiously to him, and they said, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, O king, um, mm, uh, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with men. But that's what I pay you for, to be connected with the gods. 
And now you are admitting that you cannot access the information I said yesterday that people object to Daniel because they object to predictive prophecy. And now Daniel himself raises the question. Isn't that interesting? Daniel was aware, as aware of this problem as many a theology department in the contemporary world. Is there such a thing as revelation. These people, you see, were intellectually trained to analyze trends in economics, in politics, in history, movements of people, and so on, to guess what was going to happen. Every government has them. But we have no access to the world beyond. So when put under pressure, they were naturalists. This universe is all that exists. There is no such thing as revelation. These are very big issues, aren't they? That is the major objection that I meet from my colleagues. This universe is a closed system of cause and effect. To speak of prophecy is absurd because that speaks of hidden information that we cannot access because there is no realm that is so related to space, time and history that that information could actually exist. So we can't tell you. So Daniel hears about it and uh, Nebuchadnezzar loses his temper and determines to kill a lot of them. Whom he would he slew, whom he would he kept alive. He was an absolute monarch of the ancient kind. So Daniel went to his house and told his friends. And there occurred the first university students prayer meeting we read of in history. <laughs> Isn't it magnificent though? The vast empire at the peak of its culture and a bunch of four lads are there praying to God. God, it's magnificent. Ought to get your heart. Some of you come from countries where there are very few believers. Be encouraged. This is a vast empire and there were four of them who dared to believe it was worth talking to God about it. Their lives were at stake, of course. When they knelt and prayed in Babylon, long way away from Judah. They could have been excused for giving up on their faith because of what had happened to them. But they hadn't. They still knelt and prayed in an alien land. And asked God to help them defeat a superpower. It's big stuff, isn't it? Challenges me. Do you know? All of you know far more than they did about God. You've got the whole of the Old Testament and the whole of the New. They didn't know a fraction of what you know. Or I know. And they knelt and prayed to God. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those of understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him to you, O God of my fathers. I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. 
for you have known to us the king's matter. And Daniel gets up and goes to request uh, an appointment with the emperor. How did he know he knew? There are many epistemological questions arise in the book of Daniel. You can note them as we go through. I'll not refer to them in any detail. How did he know he knew? And he goes to Arioch and he says, don't kill the wise men. Oh, the generosity of that. Daniel shows a remarkable sensitivity. He understood the fear of the man who didn't want him to just eat vegetables. And he was sensitive to it. And he said, look, test us. Just give us a chance. And if it doesn't work, stay where you are. Daniel's attitude to his pagan colleagues is exemplary. We need to imitate it. And now he goes to men who would later seek to destroy his own life. Who really had no idea of what they were doing. And he says, don't, don't kill them. Let me get into the emperor. And I want you to imagine the mighty throne room down the processional way. And a young man walks in to stand in front of the king. And Nebuchadnezzar sitting between his chained lions in the magnificent throne room addresses him. Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? And Daniel speaks. No wise men, enchanters, magicians or astrologers could show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But, your majesty, there is a God. Stand with him and see the courage of it. There is a God, your majesty. Who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Daniel didn't stop. Your dream. And the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed. And there, the emperor of the world, so to speak, stood transfixed as this young Hebrew intellectual showed him that he had access to information that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't dream of and his entire think tank couldn't. And Daniel instantly gained an irreversible authority. And as a result, we know he was promoted over all the wise men in Babylon. He knew that he knew, you know. And he relayed the dream and told Nebuchadnezzar exactly what he had seen. And then he started to interpret it. You saw a colossal man, Nebuchadnezzar. It got a head of gold. You are the head of gold. Well, that wasn't bad for a start, was it? <laughs> Some people think that Daniel is to be written and ascribed to the genre of apocalyptic, the doom-laden. Well, it's partly true. But this was a dream from God, and it was an analysis of kingdoms, and it represented Nebuchadnezzar's as a head of gold. There's something very positive about that, wasn't there? And of course, there came a succession of different metals. Because the next thing that Daniel had to say to Nebuchadnezzar, after you, wow. You imagine telling Nebuchadnezzar there would be an after him. <laughs> there will arise a kingdom inferior to you. There comes the relative term. And you know as the metals increase in strength, they decrease in value. It was values in chapter 1. It is values in chapter 2. There was to be a succession of kingdoms. And the interesting thing is this. There was to be a transition of power. 
Babylon was to give way to, well, we know what to because it happens in the very book. Daniel experienced the first transition to the Medo-Persian kingdom and then to the Greek and then to the Roman, the Iron Kingdom. I'm not going to go into all the arguments left, right and centre. I'm simply going to be mildly dogmatic here. You can read all the commentaries if you like. And I hope you do. But let's get the basic ideas here. There was to be a succession of kingdoms. And you say, well, that's obvious. I mean, but was it obvious then? How many world empires had there been up to that point? Was there any real reason why Nebuchadnezzar shouldn't have believed that his would last forever? There was to be a succession. And he was told a series of lessons, and I'm just going to mention them briefly as we come to a stop. Firstly, that God is the source of imperial power. He'd been given his power. That, of course, is a thoroughly biblical doctrine that we get repeated in the New Testament. That God is at some level behind the powers that be. He allows them to run the world. That raises all kinds of questions, of course, that you will have to go into individually. Secondly, that the tenure of power is limited after you. After. Thirdly, Political systems, whatever they are, are not of absolute value. Now this is the difficult one. Throughout the whole of history, there have been people who have confused a given political system with the kingdom of God. Now I'm treading into deep theological water. But if you're skating on thin ice, the best thing to do is skate fast. <laughs> I simply want you to observe, ladies and gentlemen, that the stone kingdom that comes crashing in on this image is not part of the image. It's supernatural. It is cut out without hands. And that phrase without hands is a technical phrase that you find both in the Old and the New Testament. It means it's supernatural. And it comes crashing from outside. Well now is that image telling us something important? Could it be? That the kingdom of God will not be introduced as a kingdom that slots on to the end of whatever precedes it. Why is that? Well, because no system of government is of absolute value, even though there is real difference in the relative value. My children didn't have to work in a mine. I'm very glad of that. Aren't you? Although sadly in some parts of the world there are thousands of children essentially in slavery, as we know. Thank God for advance in at least some of the democracies in this world. But it would be a risky thing to come to the conclusion that any particular form of government, although it might be relatively better than something else, is of absolute value. Now this man looked very impressive. It was a huge colossus, but there was something wrong with its feet. And the expression in English, feet of clay, comes from this book of Daniel. He has feet of clay. And what we refer to when we use that of a leader or of anybody is that they're unstable. They're not standing in a stable way. It doesn't analyze it any further. A colossal man, M-A-N, -M, written big, that's flawed. Now, following that hint, you could spend a very long time analysing why it is that people are flawed. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to end on this wonderful note. The stone kingdom. What is that? What a brilliant image this is. Because a colossal stone contrasted with all the dust is a stable thing. 
Behold, said Isaiah, I lay in Zion a cornerstone. And Jesus referred to himself as the stone. The apostles referred to him both as a stone and the foundation on which life has to be built. Ultimate stability. And hence, of course, his qualification to reign. Now, of course, I know there'll be lots of you asking questions like this. Well, when does the stone fall in the image? Well, you might notice that if you lay the image on the ground nice and gently so it doesn't collapse and you have its head at one end, that's Babylon, and you come to the Roman Empire, you'll notice that uh, the stone doesn't fall just here. It falls at its feet, which hardly fits in with the notions of some theologians I've come across. But then, to go into that detail would take a lot of time. And I'm not going to do it. I'll leave it to you. What I want to leave you with this is this. Who are you? What's your name? What is your identity? And no matter when the stone falls, it's possible in this life to become a member of the stone kingdom. And to build on a foundation that's utterly stable. And there's a magnificent ver verse in Hebrews that says, Wherefore, having received an unshakable kingdom, may God encourage us as we look towards an uncertain future. We look down the tunnel of time. Kingdom succeeds, kingdom succeeds. But then one day, as Jesus himself said, the stone will fall. Coming out of the beyond. And that kingdom will never be destroyed. Let's pray.